Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Western public, and the Jewish communities in particular, are led to believe that the West Bank is a peaceful region where the Palestine Authority has accepted the rule of the Zionist military occupation. The majority of the Jewish people in North America, Canada, the United States, do not want the occupation. Israel does not speak for us. The settlers they do not speak for us. We speak for ourselves. We, the Jewish people, say stop the occupation. How are you, Mr. Rabbi David Friedman? Fine, right? fine. Yeah, hi, how are you? Fine, 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 and you? You have an organization that's been uh, since 1938, I believe. Right. Talk to me about your organization. Uh, this organization called Neture Carta International, uh, this is Aramaic for the protectors of the city, referring to the holy city of Jerusalem. It's the city we are dealing today about. Uh, oh. This was at the time of the the beginning of the philosophy of Zionism before 1948, before the, the creation of the State of Israel, when the Jewish religious leaders of Palestine realized that this new philosophy of Zionism is going to destroy everyone, the Jewish people living in Palestine, the Palestinian Jews, okay. and the Palestinian inhabit the non-Jewish Palestinian inhabitants. Uh, this was 
obviously a danger. It was about Judaism where the Jewish leaders at the time found that this is going to destroy the Jewish religion. Why? Because this new philosophy of Zionism was a new philosophy, a new invention amongst Jewish people to, to form a national homeland for Jews. Now, uh, in terms of uh, my own background and qualifications, uh, uh, in order to do my doctoral studies, I came from Ontario, from Toronto, here to Montreal, 
to uh, uh, continue my doctoral studies at the uh, University de Quebec de Montréal. Learned French in order to do my doctoral thesis. Hi. Because uh, no other political science department in a Canadian university would allow me to do a doctoral thesis, even though I was qualified to do so. I uh, started doing my uh, university studies in, uh, in a Bachelor of Science in Physics, actually, at the University of Waterloo. But because of Palestine, I found it necessary to uh, drop the uh, scientific studies and uh, went into the graduate school in political science in order to pursue uh, um, the study of uh, political theory, political philosophy, and uh, uh, the uh, methodology required to do a, a proper critique of, uh, of the Zionist ideology, uh, which uh, I have now, now done, uh, now accomplished. And uh, my, my doctoral thesis, which is uh, published uh, there actually, does a critique of Zionism, not from a historical point of view, because that's been done. The, uh, the new historians, you know, specifically the most uh, principled of which is uh, Professor uh, Ilan Pape at Exeter University in England, has done an excellent, you know, breakdown of what happened in 48 and, and uh, the, uh, the plan, Dalit, uh, of the Zionist militias at that time to expel the population of Palestinians to the greatest extent possible to achieve the occupation of the greatest uh, amount of territory possible. So even though the UN Resolution 181 was, uh, was the uh, legal justification for the establishment of the Zionist state, nonetheless, we find that the uh, end result of the war of 1947 to 48, actually, because the Zionist war against the Palestinian people started before the recognition of the uh, state of uh, Israel by the United Nations, and the expulsion of the Palestinians began before the UN actually took up uh, and supported the resolution for the recognition of the Zionist state. And uh, the amount of territory that was allocated under Resolution 181 was about a third of the territory of Palestine. And uh, during the War of 47-48, the Zionist militias took control over two-thirds of the territory of Palestine. So while the uh, Zionist state claims Resolution 181 as justification for its legitimate existence and recognition internationally in the geopolitical system, Actually, uh, in Resolution 181 is a denial of the legitimacy of the present-day Zionist state because it uh, exemplifies the fact that the Zionist militias disregarded the resolution and the frontier that was established by the partition resolution, so-called, and went beyond that uh, frontier to establish the 1948 State of Israel which was later recognized by the United States of America within uh, the same day. Actually, Russia beat uh, the United States to the recognition of the Zionist State of Israel because the Communist parties throughout the world were pro-Zionist at the time and actually supplied not only diplomatic and propaganda support through the various Communist parties, but actually supplied the arms from Czechoslovakia so that the Zionist militias were able to fight and uh, win that uh, particular war against the Palestinians. Now, in terms of uh, the, uh, the work that I've been able to done, do, so uh, rather than going into the historical aspects, uh, and uh, rather than going into the uh, Judaic critique of Zionism, which is done as well by various individuals like Min, uh, Min, uh, Minhuin's uh, father, and uh, even some conservative, you know, right-wing uh, critiques uh, of Zionism, like the book Perfidy, which uh, critiques, you know, the Zionist militias as well. Uh, there is a modern-day uh, critique of uh, Judaic critique of Zionism from Professor Yaakov Rapkin, who teaches at the University of Waterloo. Uh, uh, excuse me, University, uh, Université de Montréal, uh, here in, 
And uh, so those areas have been taken care of. What I have done is an elaborate critique of Zionist ideology and political philosophy, going back to the origins of the nation state concept, which has been used by the Zionist ideologues to establish a state uh, along the lines of, uh, of, uh, of European you know, political uh, uh, philosophy 200 years later, totally out of context, in a completely different uh, part of the world, which has had a history um, which is very much older than that of Europe. You know, in Europe, the nation-state concept could be floated you know, for a while because Europe was colonized uh, only uh, after uh, the long period in which you know, the Middle East was, so, you know, was uh, you know, peopled you know, by the, migra the human migration patterns coming out of uh, Africa. So in the Middle East, we have you know, cities established you know, 7,000 years ago, some of the first cities in the world, in, uh, in Jericho, in, uh, in uh, Salome, uh, which was you know, the predecessor of the city now called Nablus, or in Hebrew, it's called Shem, which is the Israelis now use. When I actually went to Tel Aviv to visit uh, my cousin, who was uh, visiting her parents, who still live there, and uh, people would ask me, where am I living? And I would say in Nablus. And the Israelis did not know the name Nablus for that city, that Palestinian city, which is one of the major cities you know, in the West Bank. They call it Shem, from the biblical, you know, Hebraic name. Incredible, you know, like difference, you know, in mentalities between the Israelis, well-meaning Israelis as well, who just do not know anything about the Palestinians. And in fact, in the entrance to the Palestinian cities, there's this huge red you know, uh, signs there which proclaim in three languages that it is illegal for Israelis to enter into a Palestinian city under Israeli law and they're subject to two years imprisonment if an Israeli goes into a Palestinian city. <laughs> That's how much, you know, apartheid has been established there. It's, it's ingrained in the very law. Okay, so I have a formal presentation which is going to be the introduction to a new book of mine dealing with the transitional process of how, with the eventual recognition of the Palestine state, which I think is coming up in the Security Council in November, after the American election, and the French resolution is going to be presented to the Security Council, calling for the recognition of the state of Palestine, which has already been adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations, but the Security Council seems to have uh, more authority and geopolitical ma machinations. So this is a crucial vote, and this time the United States uh, State Department is probably not going to veto the resolution. So Palestine is going to be recognized as an independent state in the short term uh, after the American election and before Obama hands over you know, presidential authority to the winner of that election in January. So there's November, December, January, anything can happen. And it is expected that the United States is not going to veto uh, that resolution. So how do we proceed from that point forward? This is what I am beginning to address now. And uh, the introduction I have here is going to form the introduction to an introductory preface to uh, this new book in which I'm writing about the transitional process. Okay, first of all, I'd like to express my respects to the DSTT Culture Committee here in Montreal which stands for Diversity, Social Solidarity, Tolerance, and Transparency, and uh, its uh, organizer, Tarek Taha, with whom I'm working here in Montreal. Um, I would welcome you to the session of the World Social Forum 2016. The forum is one with which I identify because of the momentum that is created on an international dimension that works to become a world constituent assembly that will supersede the existing nation states and its so-called United Nations. While there are now 104, 194 recognized nations in the General Assembly, with Palestine being the 194th, it should be known that there are actually about 3,000 nations throughout the world in sociological terms. So in the actuality uh, of uh, social existence in the world, the United Nations does not represent the people of the world. It represents the nation states, the geopolitical system, 
and ignores all those nations that have not been able to achieve their independence and ignores all the nations that are confined within the existing nation states and that do not have the recognition of a nation. And uh, we can think of many such nations, uh, including the Quebecois nation, the Kurdish nation, etc., etc. So, to break out of the bonds of the geopolitical world, we need to go to the civil society of each nation and to unite our civil societies as we are doing here at the Forum. My own origin is that of a refugee kid from a Jewish family that had lived in Poland, both Warsaw and the city of Lublin. You should know that while the Zionist parties have used the Nazi Holocaust to justify a colonial project of occupation and not expulsion, it was actually in the USSR Soviet Union that the most Jewish people fled to in order to escape from the Nazis. So about 500,000 escaped to Russia, while the Zionists made deals with the Nazi regime to get 60,000 of their own party members out of Germany and only 1,843 out of Hungary. On Channel 5, this is the 10 o'clock news with Deborah Norville. It's coming out revealing secret negotiation between the Nazis and the Zionists in 1933, which allowed German Jews and their assets to go to Palestine. Rich Samuels joins us tonight with the story of the controversy behind the book and the author's struggle to write it. Rich? Deborah, with the rise of Adolf Hitler to power in the spring of 1933, the Jews of the world were faced with a dilemma. They could raise a cry of protest, a cry few would heed, or they could make a deal with Hitler, a deal that would bring a step closer their dream of an independent Jewish state. The choice they made was difficult and agonizing. This new book describes that choice. The book is called The Transfer Agreement. This is Israel a few days ago, the season of Passover. And this is Germany 51 years ago, the blossoming of Adolf Hitler's springtime. A key factor in the vitality of today's Israel, the book's author argues, was an agreement reached in 1933 between a group of Zionists and the man who would later try to kill every living Jew. The great irony is that Adolf Hitler became the chief economic sponsor of the state of Israel. It will be an argument against, and the wrong argument, against Zionists. Some who lived through those times fear the response to this book. The parents of the author feared its very writing. Uh, when your son came to you and said he was going to write this book, what, was your, what were your feelings about his undertaking? I told him he's not my son anymore. Why did you say that? I told him I'm going to sit shitty. As though he were dead? That's right. I tell him I don't like it, because as being a Jew, I didn't want something to uncover my own people. I was buried in a grave with 27 people. I was seven times captured. Edwin Black's parents are Holocaust survivors. For a lot. My parents never talked much about the Holocaust. Just Edwin Black, to fill the void left by the silence of his parents, family. has written this book a dense, detailed chronicle of the early months of 1933. January 30th, 1933. Hitler becomes Germany's interim chancellor. The Third Reich has begun. But in this country on March 4th, attention is diverted by the inauguration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. More power to you, President Roosevelt. The entire country's behind you thrilled with hope and patriotism. But ominous headlines tell what's already happening to the Jews of Germany. The protest of American Jews was heard almost immediately. It was based on only the sparsest of press reports, and nowhere was that protest more vocal than here in New York City. All crazy.
trades, local and national organizations, and labor parties are joined in this gigantic demonstration passing through famous Washington Arch. Rabbi Stephen S. Wise, honorary president of the American Jewish Congress, leads the procession down Fifth Avenue on foot. Father arranged for the first great mass meeting at Madison Square Garden to protest Hitlerism. He felt that when freedom was threatened, silence condoned oppression always. Thousands who waited hours behind police lines rush forward as the doors of Madison Square Garden are open. Jews and Gentiles join in the race for seats, and 22,000 of them get in. I was a young kid then, you see, as a teenager. And I belonged to a Zionist youth group. And uh, we were all summoned to go to that rally. Well, it was a very agitated crowd. Uh, many Yiddish speaking, a few English speaking. Uh, and um, Rabbi Wise uh, mounted a, uh, an appeal to the Jewish people to do something to, um, to save Jewish honor. Most of the important, well-established Jews were very angry at him, said this was sensationalism, and that if anything happened to the Jews in Germany, the blood of the Jews would be on his head. Dr. Stephen S. Wise, rabbi of the Free Synagogue and the national leader of liberal thought, speaks in behalf of the Jews of the United States. This is not a Jewish meeting. This is the conscience of America making itself felt. The conscience of Nazi Germany made itself felt five days later. Across the Reich, Hitler's troops shut down Jewish-owned businesses for 24 hours. Within days, American Jews marched calling for the boycott of all German exports. Jews throughout Europe echoed that call, so did Jews everywhere. But a group of Zionists at the same time was quietly negotiating an agreement with the Nazis to allow the immigration of German Jews and the transfer of their assets to Palestine. That deal, reported in August 1933, was the transfer agreement. Palestine, sparsely settled by Jews at the time, was radically changed as a result. I lived in Palestine from 1933 to 1936, and uh, we saw um, every week transports of German Jews coming to settle in Palestine. And many new professions were introduced by them into the country, and they um, played a leading role in making Palestine then a more advanced and progressive country. Israel is really what it is because of the foundation laid by the Eastern European group and then the lift toward an educated and well-organized government that, that came with the immigration of the uh, German Jewish group. German Jewish settlement of Palestine was for a time official Nazi policy. These photos of Jewish life in Palestine, along with a lengthy text, appeared in 1934 in the Berlin paper Der Angriff. The publisher, Hitler's propaganda minister, Josef Goebbels. A Nazi Visits Palestine was the title of the multi-part series. A medal was struck by Goebbels in commemoration. On one side, the swastika. On the other, the Star of David. Hitler demanded one concession for the transfer agreement, that the call for a boycott of the Reich, raised by Jews here and elsewhere, be rejected by the Zionists. The Zionists made that concession. And so, while Nazis were marching in Germany, and while Jews were marching here, diplomacy was running a more important story. In the Mediterranean, where the dream of a nation-state for Jewish people came a step closer to reality. The story in this book some will find hard to accept. I still feel the hurt, but after I read it, I said, I'm all with you. Go ahead and write it. Because everything was exactly what happened, and that's the truth, and you cannot deny it. And the truth must prevail. And I'm not worried by the people who will find the book in bad taste, the smart people, the intelligent people, the people who went through, will understand. The author is torn 
is torn between two profound feelings that he has to be for a Jewish state and that the silence which his parents have kept well he has to retaliate against that silence and he takes it out on others it was a quest it took me around the world financially it depleted me emotionally it drained me and as far as my being a Jewish person and understanding my Jewish identity and my relationship to Israel and the, Holo and the Holocaust, it has fulfilled me. So about 500,000 escaped to Russia, while the Zionists made deals with the Nazi regime to get 60,000 of their own party members out of Germany, and only 1,843 out of Hungary. And yet, the Zionist mentality continues to claim its superior position as the refuge of the Jewish people, even while they did so little to actually save the Jewish people during the Nazi occupation of Poland and the other regions there. Now, the great thing about being a second generation survivor was that my mother was from Warsaw and she was a Jewish Bundist. Now, you probably don't know what the Jewish Bund was because not only is the history of the Jewish Bund suppressed by the, uh, the forces that uh, the political political science uh, departments that failed to recognize uh, the existence of the Jewish people before the establishment of the state of Israel, because before that the Jewish nation was not supposed to exist, therefore it's you know, wiped out of you know, like historical analysis. But the Jewish Bund and what it stood for was also suppressed by the Zionist educational system, which took over all of the uh, Jewish educational institutions throughout uh, North America, South America. For instance, um, I went to a Jewish cheder, as it's called in Yiddish. In fact, English is not even my first language, and my first language is Yiddish, which is a German, a Jewish dialect of German from the Middle Ages, and it's not doesn't resemble Hebrew at all. Now, so I'm going to explain to you what the uh, Jewish Bundist uh, philosophy is, because it is the uh, fundamental critique of Zionism. That you may not know that the Jewish socialist movement was more popular than the Zionists amongst the Jewish community of Eastern Europe is essential to understanding the difference between Zionism and the Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish people, basically. As a result, I was raised in the Jewish and anti-Zionist and anti -Zionist at the same time. I did not have to torture myself to escape from a Zionist upbringing since I was allowed to know that you don't have to be a Zionist to be Jewish. The culture as religion was assumed as a given, and although we did not care to consider the validity of the theocratic religious matters after the Holocaust, the congregation each Saturday morning was the key to life. In addition to the public Protestant English school in Toronto, I also studied at the Jewish Talmud Torah in the evenings. Talmud Torah means the study of the Torah. The educational methodology in the Torah study sessions was to read through all of the Hebrew version and translate it into English. One sentence after another over seven years, together with the other books like the Talmud, the Gemara, the Mishnah. It's a very elaborate, you know, culture. However, and the great consequence was that I actually knew what was written in the Torah and so knew that the Zionist pretensions were false as to their claims in Judaism for the establishment of this Zionist state. Aside from the matter of whether the deity is a valid concept of not or not, we can nonetheless delve into that historical text to find out what was intended in the first place, rather than what the Torah has been manipulated to be believed. For example, while it is not mentioned, it is evident 
that the historical figures, they were called prophets by uh, uh, named you know uh, Noah and Abraham, were historical figures that preceded the existence of the Jewish people or nation, and it may be as it may, as it may be called as such, the covenant with Abraham was not a covenant with the Jewish people alone. You know this is evident if you just consider you know the basic facts that Abraham existed 500 years before the establishment of the Jewish people. <laughs> so right then and there, you know, you have a completely different perspective than what is presented you know, by the Zionist ideology. In the text, as it is actually written, even in the re revised Ezra version, that the covenant for the land of Canaan, for guarantee of residence and co-residence with the existing nations there, which were seven, there were seven nations, six, coexisting in the Canaan territory there of what is now called the Holy Land was for all the descendants of Abraham forever. Hmm? And the word forever is exact. It is the actual word used in Hebrew in the Torah. And the word descendants, descendants of Abraham, is also translated as the seed of Abraham or the sons of Abraham. The matter of violence. I was in uh, 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 Nablus uh, over the last uh, period of time. I was in, living in Nablus together with Palestinians for five months during this last winter. And when I arrived, I found that the, um, the uh, community center that I helped to establish a computer room for in 2011, when I was there previously, making public access computers there available for free to the internet for Palestinians in Nablus had been raided by the military and the soldiers went into the center in the middle of the night and took out all the hard drives from all the computers stole a laptop stole uh, all the Wi-Fi keys and stole the um, um, uh, a memory stick of 130 so I started working on uh, rebuilding the computers and the service that had been initiating, uh, initiated there at the, uh, at the uh, community center, which was broadcasting by internet radio, Palestine news, you know, on a bi-weekly basis. 
And this uh, radio program started to become very popular, and the, and the Zionist you know, uh, apparatus became aware of it. And uh, in the uh, first few months, uh, there was like more than a million people who had listened to the radio broadcast because they were getting news direct from the source that was not censored and not filtered. And so all this was shut down. So I was rebuilding the computers, and then with the camera, you know, I went out to all the various demonstrations and filmed them in order to document them and put them up on my YouTube channel and established a, a YouTube uh, channel for the uh, Tanweer Center as well to continue this uh, medium. So I was at the Land Day demonstration, which is March 30th. And there, a peaceful demonstration, mostly with you know an older generation of people holding banners and flags. There was uh, no large uh, numbers of youth, you know, who were there, you know, just to throw stones or anything like that. No stones were thrown, not even one stone. And this uh, the Zionist army was there to stop the demonstration from marching down the highway to a village. But. You know, everybody just walked around the soldiers and went right through, you know, the jeeps and everything like that, you know, and even put Palestinian flags into the jeeps grills, you know, as a sort of a insubordination, you know, a sign of uh, a def defiance. And then the military came and redoubled its numbers and went on top of the hill and set up a barrier that was impenetrable. And uh, people still kept on marching towards this obstruction. So that's when they started shooting tear gas canisters. Okay, about big like this, sp spitting out gas from both sides. You know, that's the model that they use. So there was, you know, one canister that was on the middle of the road in front of me. You know, people had retreated. You know, but silly me. You know, I stayed there. You know, in front of the military, I kept on filming. You know, as did a number of other people. So one young guy wanted to kick the canister away from himself but he kicked it to the wrong side of the road. He, he should have kicked it to the side of the road, which was, you know, where there was an incline going down, and it would have fallen down, but instead he kicked it towards the upside, you know, of the hill, where I was standing, you know, in the, uh, in the gutter, you know, uh, filming. So, of course, you know, I kicked it back. And then the soldier saw me, and I was fired upon, and I was hit by a, uh, a spherical bullet right on the bone here, with the leg that I had kicked the canister, their sacred canister. And I was shot right here. And I didn't even notice anything at first, you know, because there's no nerves there. But then it started to swell, and, and the shock, it's a high-velocity projectile, uh, a metal sphere about so big, covered in plastic. And they call it a rubber bullet. It sounds very innocuous, you know. But this is a high-velocity projectile. And it causes damage, you know. If it hits a soft tissue, it will tear the tissue. If it hits an eye, it will destroy an eye. If it hits a skull, it will crack the skull and cause a, con a major concussion. So uh, these are, and they call it a non-lethal uh, um, method of crowd control. And it's now starting to be used by the police in North America even, you know, because it's classified as non-lethal. However, it is, it can be lethal. And it is a very severe, you know, uh, can cause very severe, you know, uh, injury to a person. Uh, I was in shock and didn't realize that I was in shock, which is, you know, a symptom of shock. And I kept on working, went to another demonstration the next morning, went to a conference the next afternoon. And then the following morning, I thought I would climb up a ladder and ended up falling two meters down onto the, uh, you know, uh, s uh, stone floor end up uh, injuring my back, which I'm still recovering from, and uh, uh, hitting my head, going unconscious, and, and, and getting uh, requiring four stitches to stop the bleeding. All because of that. So, and they talk about violence. The first violence is inflicted upon the civilian Palestinians by the Zionist military. Okay. Uh, whether it's called... Uh, uh, crowd control or whatever, it's still violence. Then, when Palestinians attack, uh, you know, this is a war against the Palestinian people that is being conducted to the greatest extent possible permitted, you know, by the opposition that they have to endure. So, but when Palestinians retaliate against the military personnel, 
and spontaneously Palestinians, young Palestinians even, go out and try to attack you know, an, uh, a Zionist soldier because a member of their family has recently been killed. And Palestinians are shot with live bullets at demonstrations, nonviolent demonstrations even, on an almost daily basis. And, and a Palestinian uh, with some uh, f f familial connection uh, to a Palestinian who has been killed goes out and tries to retaliate on their own in a spontaneous fashion without the encouragement you know, of the uh, political authority in Palestine that has been established from Oslo, they are called terrorists. <laughs> Will you have your complete land back? All, all, all our land. And nothing else.